Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13. As I do sometimes, not all of the time, but I will read a passage of Scripture to get us headed in the right direction, to get us launched in the right theme, and then we will go to other portions of Scripture to draw out similar and other thoughts along the same theme and along the same subject matter, and that's what I'm going to do tonight. You know, when, when I read the Word of God, I, I don't just read it. Oh, I'm, I'm like everybody else. There's times that you know you're supposed to read it and it just seems like you're not getting anywhere and you read and you read. And then other times it just seems that every little thing speaks to you or at least you question and you think, now, I wonder how that went down. I wonder what that was. I wonder how that's going to be, and that's one of these here, but 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13, Paul is in the midst of giving a list of things that he wants Timothy to do before he comes to visit him, and he said, the coat or the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when you come, bring it with you, and the books but especially the parchments. You may be seated. I want to preach tonight. It's time to hit the books. School's about ready to start, Zach. Time to hit the books. Yeah, I didn't see what you said. He mouthed something, but probably had something to do. I'm not happy or I'm not looking forward to it. (laughs) Amen. Some of the things that I wonder about at times is you understand that when Paul wrote this, he knew that his death was imminent. He realized that he was going to die any day. And yet he, Brother Lonnie, asked for these books and these parchments. I wonder what was in those books. I wonder what was there that Paul wanted. We all understand that you need your coat, that you've left with somebody else, but, you know, the books, unless you are an avid reader or you're in a position you need to do a lot of studying and as such, you know, books are important to those individuals. So there's been a lot of people that have taken a stab at what the contents of these books were, but we really don't know. There's really not a clue, so... We're not going to know what was in them, and especially these parchments that Paul, knowing that he's going to die, but that were so important to him that he wanted. But nonetheless, uh, you know, he said that I, I want them. It got me to thinking then if there are books important and about reading, and I got to thinking about books then and how it's related in the Word of God. And this is one fact that I had not really read or studied previously that I was a little surprised by. The word books and books and book singular is not mentioned all that many times in the Word of God, several times. But when you bring in the illusion of reading such as you know, somebody read something, or if you read, there has to be something in print for you to read it. So that means there is a book, an article, a manuscript in a book or in a parchment. And do you realize that the allusion to reading in books is around 500 times in the Word of God? So I think God's concerned about the books. I think God's concerned about books. And he wants us to be concerned about the books that are important to us. 
there's a couple and really more than a couple, but there are references in the Word of God that are, you know, they're interesting. There's no great revelation to them. It's just a statement and one that I've often thought about and certainly understood and realized as I've sat at my desk and I'm physically tired. And, you know, if you have to do other kinds of work when you're tired, you can kind of go ahead and do that. But when you're just sitting and you're trying to think while you're tired, it's, it's, it's very wearisome. And I've thought about what the wise man said in Ecclesiastes 12 and 12. To the making of books there is no end. And much study... is wearisome to the flesh. It is. So you kids, when you're tired of studying, just tell your mom and dad it's scriptural. That much study is wearisome to the flesh. There's another one that I've often thought about, and I can't wait to see what, what all, because we won't know until we get to heaven, Brother Mike. But John, in his gospel, the very last verse there in chapter 21, as he finishes up and he said, this is what I've written And we know that John wrote so that individuals would understand that this man called Jesus is truly the Messiah. He is the Son of God. They'd already begun to call that into question, and that's why he wrote his gospel. But the very last verse in his gospel goes something like this, and I'll paraphrase. And he said, and many more things did Jesus do. And I I suppose that if they should be written, that all the books that would be written to be placed in what all the Lord has done, that this world could not contain them. Can you imagine how many books? I... When I read the Bible, I visualize that and I think, how many books and what a great God, what a wonderful Savior, and what John is making reference to. But in all of these references to books and it's time to hit the books and God is concerned, there are three tonight references that are really important and really Wednesday night kind of got me uh, thinking about this as well and some of that which we dealt with. And that's these books are the ones that that I want to talk to you about time to hit the books. First of all, I believe that it's time that we understand and realize and crack the book, open them, hit them, whatever case you want to Whatever you want to call it, it's the book of the living is what I refer to it as. And it's in Psalm 139. That's where we just reference ever so briefly Wednesday night on a point that we were making. And I want to go back there yet again. And I want us to see this important book of Almighty God, that is, it relates to every one of us, and it's one that we certainly need to be concerned about. Notice with me, I'm not going to read all of it, but but this is where the writer, and no doubt David, that is, he is referring here of how that God has made him And let's just start there in 139, Psalm 139, and notice here starting at verse 16. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being imperfect, 
And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, which as yet there was none of them. In your book they are written. Now the Bible doesn't give a name to this particular book of the Lord, but I call it the book of the living because of the contents of what is in there. Certainly the contents ought to bring reference to the title and the title ought to give you a short synopsis of what the contents of the book is. And I call it the book of the living uh, because it's not just a list of every individual man, woman, male, female, boy, girl that has ever been born upon the face of this earth. Uh, That's not the kind of the book of the living that I'm referring to. But in this book, it is a book of Almighty God. It is a book that the Lord has penned about you and about me and about every one of us and it's plans that God has for us and that he knows all about us even before we were ever born. There is a book of the living and you're in it and I'm in it. The two main things that David makes reference that's in this book is God knows my features. Did you see it there that that your eyes did see my substance even though it's imperfect? What he's making reference to is that baby that is in the womb of the mother but it hasn't taken on the form of what we would think of a human form yet. It's just go all the way back to conception where, where, you know, the egg has been fertilized and that's all it is. It's just two cells that have come together. But even when you and I were no more than the union of two cells, that God already had a book And his eyes saw my eyes before I ever had eyes. And he knew what color they were going to be. He knew what color my hair was going to be, whether I liked it or not. He knew what my facial features were going to be. He knew was I going to take after uh, the Berg side or the Gold Eisen side on various features. He understood my hands. Would they be big? How tall am I going to be? Are my feet going to be big or small? God knew my name. And so let me tell you, church, that this book of the living, I believe that it is still there. And those unborn children, the reason that abortion is so horrendous, can you imagine that all of these human beings that's in God's living book of what he had purpose and plan for them and they were snuffed out before they were even ever David said in this book, not only were my features written, and as you go back there, we know that they were because that's what he says. Your eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect. And in your book, and if you'll notice there, it says all my members. My members is italicized, which simply means the interpreter supplied that. And there's no doubt that he's referencing that, but that's not, that's not everything. I would like it just the way it was. And in thy book, all were written. Not just my members, not just that you know the color of my hair and my eyes and how tall and you know my features. But it's kind of a connecting phrase to the next one that not only in this book, Lord, did you record my features, but 
you have recorded some of my future. He says, all was written. And then he said, which in continuance were fashioned. And that word continuance there, it speaks of a day passing a day. And so literally what he's saying, that my days were counted as well. Not only did you know who I am and my features, but you had a plan for me and you know how many days that I'm going to live and walk upon the face of this earth and what God intended for me to do within the time that he has given me living and breathing upon the face of this earth. The book of the living. So when I begin to think about that, here's what I ask myself all the time. And as I get older in ministry, I think of this more often, that even if Jesus tarries and I continue to pastor until however long that I am, I still have uh, already passed more days than I have ahead of me. But here's what I think. God, this is what you wrote. This is what you had planned for me. This is what you said that I was going to be. How much of that have I changed? How much of that have I come short of? How much of that have I redone because I didn't like what you have done? How far along the line am I accomplishing what you said that you wanted me to accomplish. This is a book we need to crack. This is one we need to be concerned about. Have I even come close to fulfilling the plan of God, Brother Bill, in my life? God had it all written out day by day by day by day. And how close have I come to fulfilling it? And the old song says, I don't want to leave you know, any unfinished task. But will I leave a lot of unfinished tasks because I have not cracked the book of the living knowing that God is such a great God, made me uniquely, and has a unique plan for me. But have I got so caught up in my own plans that God's plans have come to naught? We'll know one of these days. There's not only the book of the living that we need to crack, but there is the book, books of labor that we need to be concerned about as well. We've discussed these thoroughly on Wednesday nights as well, but going back to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11 there, here the writer John is giving us a little bit of insight into when the lost will stand before their judgment before God and give an account of everything that they've done. And he he says here, of course, this is called the great white throne judgment. Once again, it's the judgment for those that are lost. And he said there, and I saw a great white throne And him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And notice, and the books were opened. And another book, singular, was opened which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. And and he says, according to their works. So if they're judged according to what was in the books, and it's according to their works, then here are a slew of books that has to do with man's labor in the time that the book of the living declared that God had and gave a purpose for us. 
So can you understand how books are important to God? He has this one that it's kind of like his planner on his, on his desk in his office in heaven. Here's my planner, and here's Rich Goldison, and here's Diane Jackson, and here's Mike Walker, and, and, you know, just on and on, every one of us here. But then there's also books with our names on them that has to do with the labors of Rich Goldison. Do you realize that your name is in a lot of books in heaven? Your name is in a lot of books in heaven. And he goes on, he says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I don't think that I need to. We dealt so much with it in, on Wednesday night. But here's the point. You see, individuals are not going to get their final place in the lake of fire until they are judged. You remember we said that in Luke 16, when you read about the rich man and Lazarus and all about hell that you mentioned there, this is the generic, this is what everybody's going to receive. This, this is before they've been judged. And as we said, everybody's not going to receive the same punishment in hell. And so to be, be able to understand and to know exactly the degree of punishment they're going to receive, that's why these books of our works are kept from the time that we're born till the time that, that we die unless we have asked the Lord to forgive us. And then, of course, he's able to wipe the slate clean. But for those individuals that, that are not born again and they are not saved, then they're going to be judged out of their works, out of their labors, that every thought, every act, every thing they ever did, everything they ever said has been recorded in the book of labor with their name on it and they will be judged determining uh, the degree of punishment that they will receive in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone. The Bible doesn't reference such as the judgment of the redeemed of the Lord because everybody's not going to have the same in heaven either. Everybody's not going to have the same capabilities in heaven. Some are going to have a greater capacity for enjoying heaven than other people will have of enjoying heaven. But it's all based upon how faithful and the works and I believe that one of the reasons the books are, are kept is because Jesus made it very clear that at the judgment of the damned, there's going to be people that, that are actually going to argue with the Lord. In Matthew chapter 7, some's going to say, Lord... Didn't we cast out these demons? Lord, didn't we do this and this supernatural manifestation? And, and Lord, all of this and all of this. And, and now you're saying that I don't deserve to go to heaven? Come on, Lord. What's going on here? And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. But you see, the books are going to be kept so that he can point to every date and every time and say, you remember when you had this opportunity? Remember when you did this? Remember when somebody invited you to church? Remember when the Holy Spirit dealt with you? Remember when you couldn't sleep that night? Remember, 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 remember the books, the books, the books of the labors of our lives. And if there's ever books that we need to crack and be concerned about, it's the book that you and I are still continuing to write. The final chapters have not been written yet. But as to our labors, either against the Lord or for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
The last book that really takes preeminence in the Word of God and that books are so important to the Lord. It's not just the book of the living which speaks of the purposes and the plans that God has for us even before we were born. It's not just the books of the labors here that are kept track of our lives and how we've lived our lives for or against the Lord. But the last one is the book of the Lamb. The book of the Lamb. We're already there in Revelation 21. Just turn over to Revelation, or we're already there in Revelation 20. Just turn over to Revelation 21. And 27. And as John describes this wonderful place and what can and cannot enter in, he said, And there shall in no wise enter into it, that's this glorious city, this new Jerusalem, this place of the bride of Christ, their their dwelling place, enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. It's time to crack the books. The book of the living, the book of our labors, the book of the Lamb. You know, the size, and I know that I came originally old school when no computer and everything you had had to be books, and I had a lot more books than I have now. Got rid of a lot of books when computers have come on the scene, but some that you can't find online, and I'll never get rid of those. But books are very important, and, you know, people will walk into the office and and, uh, they'll say, Pastor, have you read all those books? And I say, no, I haven't read all of them through and through, but I'll guarantee I've cracked every one of them. there, There is something in every one of them that I have gleaned something from, I've learned something from. And, uh, you know, maybe not read from cover to cover, but I got it because of one chapter that I wanted or something such as that. And... In, in, in the very, as you open the book before you actually get to the table of contents, right up in that right-hand corner, I just simply put Rich Gold Eyes in. I don't loan out my books very often, but if somebody asks something, I don't mind to say, sure, here, take this if you would enjoy this. And But it's not casual reading that I have. And... Uh, because I want my, you know, I want my book back if it's one that I can't get a hold of again. That's why I have my name in it. But I say all that to say this, out of all of the books, and I don't even know how many I have left, but out of all of the books that I have my name in, Rich Gold Eisen, this is the book that I want to make sure that my name is in. My name is already, whether I want it to be or not, is in the book of the living. My name is already in the books of the labors. But here's one that I get to choose whether my name is in. It's the Lamb's book of life. And when he says of life, he's not just talking about living. That goes back to the book of living in Psalm 139. But this is the life that only Jesus can give. That's why it's called the Lamb's book of life. It's the only life that the Lamb of God is able to give. As John saw Jesus passing by and he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And so this life that he's speaking about, the Lamb's book of life, it is those that have not just been born by a biological mother and father, but it's those that have been born again by the blood of the Lamb. And he's speaking about this eternal life, this everlasting life, this abundant life that only Jesus Christ is able to give. 
And you see, when we become a child of God, our name is inscribed in the Lamb's book of life. And that's why when you even go back to Revelation at this judgment of the damned, and you see that the books, plural, are open according to their works. And then the Bible says there was another book, singular, that was open, which is the book of life. The book of life. I believe the reason the Lamb's book of life will be there is because the Lord will show them your name is not here. Your name is not inscribed here. And you had every opportunity to have it inscribed, to have it placed, but you did not. And so as I think about all of these things, the Apostle Paul, thinking, will I be killed tomorrow? Will it be the next day? Monday, will it be this week coming? But even in the midst of that, we would have probably said, what does it matter? But he said, Timothy, bring me the books and especially the parchments. The books were important to Paul. Books are important to God. But are books important to me? Do I take a concern in the book of the living, the book of the labors, and the book of the Lamb? Am I concerned about what is written therein or if my name is written therein at all? It's time to crack the books. It's time to be concerned about the books. Father, I love you tonight and I praise you. And Lord, I just ask that you would help me. Father, that I pray that you do have the book of the living, I call it. How am I measuring up? You have the book of my labors, Lord. Am I, am I even coming close? What, what is written therein? How will it stack up when it's revealed one of these days? What kind of rewards will I receive, God, if indeed my name is in the book of the Lamb? The book of life, that this book of the names of every individual that has fallen on their face at Calvary said, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I am a sinner. Save me from this awful damnation. And Lord, that, that you in no wise will turn anyone aside. But you have saved us and you have inscribed our name in the Lamb's book of life. So yeah, Lord, school's about to start. and There's going to be a lot of focus on books. But I pray that we at South Roxana first, that here at this season of, of school starting and even in the midst of a lot of computers, there's still a lot of books. So God, help us to be thinking about God's books. As Paul was concerned, as you are concerned, help us to be concerned about the books and the reflection that they're going to render towards me one of these days. I thank you for it and I praise you for it in the name of Jesus. If you'd like to pray tonight,